Today, we're looking at section 1.2, which is about data classification. So there are many different types of data, and being able to distinguish between the different types is important. So the first kind of data we want to look at is called qualitative data. Qualitative comes from the same root word as qualities. If you were asked to describe somebody and list their qualities, what would you say? Qualities are things like they're smart, they're funny, they're caring. They're descriptions of attributes that the person has. So qualitative data is going to be data that consists of names, labels, attributes, or descriptions. This is completely non-numeric data. The second type of data is called quantitative data. Quantitative coming from the same root word as quantity. When we talk about quantities, we're talking about how much of something we have. We're talking about a number. And so what quantitative data is, is it's data consisting of numerical measurements or counts. And this is strictly numeric data. Now, there are instances that are a little bit confusing where you'll see numbers, but they're non-numeric. So how could a number not be numeric? And that's when you have a number that is a label or a description. Can you think of any instances where there are numbers where those numbers aren't used for calculation, but they're used as a description? Think about that for a second. Did you think of any examples? Well, here's a couple. A phone number. A phone number is non-numeric data. Even though it's comprised of numbers, it's a description. It's a label for the way to get in touch of your particular phone. Your address. It's a label of that particular parcel of land on a map. Your social security number your school student ID number. These are numbers that are used as labels. They're labeling you as an individual. There's no calculations that we do with those. So those would be qualitative data, even though they have numbers in them. So just because a piece of data has numbers doesn't make it quantitative. Sometimes data that has numbers are qualitative if those numbers are just labels. So it gets a little sketchy sometimes when you're trying to determine which one's which. You have to ask yourself, would I be doing calculations with these numbers? Or are these numbers just there as labels? If you could do calculations, then it's quantitative. If they're just labels, then it's qualitative. So sometimes you'll see both types of data together. Actually, you see it a lot. You'll see it especially in table forms like this example. So a recent high school graduate received five scholarships shown in the table below. They received the Rodman Scholarship for $3,500, the EECU Scholarship for $1,000, a Rotary Club Scholarship for $500, a Kiwanis Club Scholarship for $500, and the ICF Scholarship for $300. So when you look at this table, what different types of data do you have in the table? In this case, there's both qualitative and quantitative data. So the scholarship names are qualitative data because they're labels, they're names, they're descriptions. But the amounts of the scholarships are quantitative data because you could do calculations with those. You could add them up, you could multiply them, you could divide them. Those numbers have meaning. So those are quantitative. So here we had a table that had both qualitative and quantitative data. So we can further classify data. And to do that, we need to think about some things. So when you're dealing with data, sometimes it makes sense to do certain types of calculations. Other times it doesn't. 
And this all depends on the level of measurement of the data. So not only are there different types of data, qualitative and quantitative, but there's different levels of measurement at which data can occur. And understanding what those levels of measurement are will be important because it will tell you what types of calculations you can do. So let's look at the levels of measurement. There are four of them. And the first one is the nominal level of measurement. So when you have nominal, the word nominal comes from the same root word as the word name. So nominal level data is data that consists of only qualitative data. We're talking about names, labels, and descriptions. If all you have are names, labels, and descriptions, it doesn't make any sense to do computations. How do you do an addition problem with two names? How do you multiply two descriptions? It doesn't make sense to do, so data at the nominal level has no calculations that can happen. The second level of measurement is called the ordinal level. Ordinal comes from the same root word as order. So at this level of measurement, you have qualitative or quantitative data. You can have either type. The data can be placed in a meaningful order. That's why we call it ordinal. Anything that can be ordered is ordinal. But again, numerical differences between positions are meaningless. There are no calculations that you are going to be able to perform. The only thing that you'll be able to do with this data that you couldn't do with nominal data is place it in order, a meaningful order. Now understand, alphabetical order is not a meaningful order. We're talking about things like orders of magnitude. So you could, for instance, list earthquakes by their magnitude from greatest to smallest. That would be ordinal data. The next level of measurement is the interval level of measurement. So now at the interval level, we no longer have qualitative data. This consists only of quantitative data. So just like the ordinal level, we can put these in a meaningful order. So data that's at the interval level can be put in a meaningful order. But we can do more than that. Now we can do subtractions. Numerical differences between positions are meaningful. So if I subtract the numbers from this data, that difference has a meaning. But then we talk about something called an inherent zero. And zeros at this level are not inherent zeros. So we're going to define what an inherent zero is in a few moments. But for right now, know that if your data is at the interval level, then the zero is not an inherent zero. The last level of measurement is called the ratio level. And at this level, we are at only quantitative information, just like at the interval level. We can put the data in a meaningful order. The differences have meaning. But now we get one extra calculation that we can do. The ratios of data values are meaningful. Ratios mean divide. And at this level of measurement, the zeros are inherent. So understand about the levels of measurement. As you go up, as you get a higher and higher level of measurement, nominal is the weakest level of measurement. Then ordinal is stronger, interval is stronger, and the highest level of measurement is ratio. As you progress up that chain, you don't lose any features. So ordinal, you could put things in order. So interval, you'll also be able to put things in order, but then you'll be able to do the extra subtraction. At ratio, you'll still be able to put things in order. You'll still be able to do the subtraction, but now you can do division. So you're basically adding extra features to those level of measurement. Each level of measurement, as you move up that chain, you can do more and more and more things. Okay, so let's finally 
determine what an inherent zero is. What is an inherent zero? Well, you may not believe it or may not even understand it at first, but zero doesn't always mean zero. Strange as it may sound, zero does not always mean zero. There are some types of measurements where zero is just a point on a measurement scale, and there are meaningful values on the scale above and below zero. Can you think of any? Can you think of any times where zero isn't the lowest thing on the scale? Any measurements where zero is just a point on the scale and not the bottom of the scale? Because that's really what we're talking about. If zero is a point on the scale and not at the bottom, then it's not inherent. If zero is a point on the scale and it's the bottom of the scale, there's nothing below it, then it's an inherent zero. So can you think of any that are not inherent? Here's a couple examples. Temperature is not an inherent zero. So for instance, if you look at Celsius or Fahrenheit temperature, a measurement of zero degrees Fahrenheit does not mean there's no heat. Zero is just a point on that scale. You can be 14 degrees below zero. Zero is not at the bottom of the scale because there are temperature values that are found that are below zero. Once you can go below zero, it's not an inherent zero. Altitude is also an example where it's not an inherent zero. So when we measure altitude, we're measuring altitude relative to sea level. So there are places in the world, for instance, like Death Valley, that are several hundred feet below sea level. They're not underwater, but they're inland places that are actually below sea level. So it would be possible to get in a plane and fly below sea level. If you were 100 feet off the ground, you would still be below sea level. Sea level would be the zero for altitude. So if you were actually flying in Death Valley only about 100 feet off the ground, your altitude would be negative, even though you're not on the ground or under the ground. So altitude is another measurement where there's not an inherent zero. So what's our actual definition for an inherent zero? Well, an inherent zero is a zero that actually means zero. It's a measurement where zero means zero. You can think of it as a measurement where zero is the bottom of the measurement scale. That is an inherent zero. So for instance, if you have a race and you're timing the runners, that would be an inherent zero because there's no way a runner can do the race in negative time. That's one way that you can help yourself answer questions is asking yourself, is there a possibility of negative values? If there are negative values, it can't be an inherent zero because that would mean that zero is not the bottom of the scale. You can't have a negative time to run a race. It's going to take you some positive amount of time, so that won't fall below zero. Think about the number of hours that you work per week. Could you work negative hours? And the answer is no. You could work no hours if you weren't on the schedule, if maybe you were on vacation or, or you were being let go by your boss, but you couldn't work negative hours. So that would be an inherent zero. So just ask yourself, is it possible to have a negative value? If it is possible to have a negative value, then it's not an inherent zero. If it's not possible to have a negative value, then it is an inherent zero. So let's look at some examples. Let's see if you can identify the level of measurement for what's shown. So we'll talk about some altitude info. We've got four different cities and their altitude at sea level. So Fresno is 308 feet above sea level. Death Valley is 279 feet below sea level. Denver is 5,183 feet above sea level. And Monterey is 33 feet above sea level. 
Interesting little fact. How do you measure the sea level of a city or a place? For instance, if you've ever been to Monterey, you know that you can literally walk right down into the ocean, like when you're at uh, Cannery Row by Bubba Gump's. There's a little beach access right there that's part of the city of Monterey. So how could Monterey be 33 feet above sea level if I can literally walk into the ocean and still be in the city of Monterey? The reason for that is when they take a city and they are measuring its altitude above sea level, they measure that altitude at City Hall. So apparently where City Hall is in the city of Monterey is 33 feet above sea level. So that's how they come up with the official height above sea level for a city. So where Fresno City Hall is, it's 308 feet above sea level. Denver's is 5,183 feet above sea level. Now that makes them liars, right? Isn't Denver the mile high city? Well, if it's the mile high city, it should be at least 5,280 feet above sea level. It's only 5,183 feet. So they're about 97 feet short of being the Mile High City. So you should, uh, you should protest. You should send letters to the mayor and tell them they need to change their nickname. So when you look at this measurement, these cities along with their altitudes, would this be at the nominal, ordinal, interval, or racial levels of measurement? So this data, because it's altitude info, we can put it in a meaningful order. We could go from the highest one to the lowest one. That's meaningful because it's an order of magnitude. So we know it's at least ordinal. The differences are meaningful. So for instance, if you did 308 minus 33, you would get 275. That means that Fresno is 275 feet higher above sea level than Monterey is. So that's a meaningful calculation. So now we're at least at the interval level. And then we ask ourselves, are we at the ratio level? And that's all about the zero. Is the zero an inherent zero? Or are there meaningful values that are less than zero? Because we have meaningful values that are less than zero, for instance, Death Valley's altitude, this cannot be at the ratio level because the zero is not inherent. So this one, is at the interval level of measurement. Let's try another one. This represents employment info. So we have four employees, James, Tom, Josefina, and Brandy, and the hours they work per week. So we want to know, would this be at the nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio level of measurement? So we start by asking, is it more than just a list of names? or attributes, or descriptions? Is there a numeric component? And there is. So once we have a numeric component, then we're starting to think it's higher than just nominal. Are those numbers more than labels? Yes, they are. They're a count of things. So we're moving up to at least the ordinal level. We could put these in order by who works the most hours. And as a matter of fact, they're listed in that order. That's a meaningful order because it lists by magnitude. So then we start asking ourselves questions about what we can do with the numbers to see if we can get to a higher level of measurement. If I subtract those levels of measurement, does that mean anything? So if you think about 40 hours minus 30 hours, you get 10 hours. That means that James works 10 more hours than Tom does. That's a meaningful value. So now we've gone to the interval level of measurement. Then we ask ourselves, can we get all the way to the ratio level? That's the highest level of measurement. Well, do divisions mean anything here? And so if I took 40 and divided by 10, James hours divided by Brandy's hours, 40 divided by 10 is 4. Does that 4 mean anything? And the answer is yes. It means that James works four times as many hours as Brandy does. So once we can do a ratio, once we can do a division problem, then this becomes the ratio level of measurement. You could tell by the zero. There's no way to get meaningful values here 
that are below zero. If you're asked for the number of hours that people work, you can't have negative hours. Now you might say, well, I've been working with people and it seems like they do less than nothing when they're at the job. And that's true. I've worked with a lot of people like that. But they're still getting paid for positive hours. So they can't work negative hours, which means this is an inherent zero. So this is at the racial level of measurement. Let's look at another example. Identify the level of measurement. So we have more employment info. These are places I've worked. These are actually places I have worked. So other than State Center Community College District, Peter Piper Pizza, worst job ever. Uh, Collector's Paradise, Sizzler, Hometown Buffet, San Joaquin Memorial. So these are all different places that I've worked. And we want to know what level of measurement is this list at. Well, there's no quantitative information here. To be at the interval level or at the ratio level, we would have to have quantitative information. Since there's no numbers associated here, then the best we could do is nominal or ordinal. Is there a meaningful order? Well, there might be, but we don't know it. So for instance, if we had years listed when we worked at a particular place, then we could say, oh, all right, we could put those in order. But because there's no associated data with this telling us when we work someplace, there's no way to know in what order I worked at those particular places. So we have no mechanism by which to put this data in a meaningful order. All it is is a list and remember, alphabetical is not a meaningful order. So this is just at the nominal level of measurement. Let's look at another example. Identify the level of measurement for this personal info. Favorite things to do. Now this is not a list of my favorite things to do because uh, I'm not on Facebook. You won't see me skating. Uh, I'll play a few little games on my phone, but I'm not a gamer. And uh, exercise, uh, the most exercise I get is lifting the fork from the plate to my mouth. So um, this is not a list of my favorite things to do, but apparently somebody was questioned, and this is the list of their favorite things to do. They like to exercise, they like to go on Facebook, they like to go skating, and they're a gamer. So, what level of measurement are these things at? Well, apparently when this person created their list, they were asked to list them in order of the things that they like to do most. So they listed as their number one favorite thing to do, exercise. And the number two thing was Facebook. They put them in an order that was meaningful to the person. Because this data is in a meaningful order to that person, this is now at the ordinal level. It couldn't be at the ratio or interval level because there's not a numeric component. The 1, 2, 3, and 4 are non-numeric. They're labels. But they are representative of order of importance, so we can use them for that. So this would be at the ordinal level of measurement. So that brings us to an end of section 1.2. Please look on Pearson for your homework, and have a great day.